Babies, do you see them as sweet and innocent? Do you want to just hug them and play all day? Or are they more trouble than they're worth, with never-ending demands and always making messes? The reality is a mix of both. Babies and children are lovable, sweet, innocent beings, but they do have never-ending needs, and their demands may seem unreasonable and impossible. Psychologists, researchers, and theorists have studied child development for many years, and today we'll learn about some of them. Today's program will help you understand babies and children. You've all seen one of these, but what does it have to do with child development? It has to do with Sigmund Freud. Freud believed every person was made up of three parts, the id, the ego, and the superego. The id is pretty basic. It wants things which bring pleasure and wants to avoid things that bring pain. For a baby, this means food, cuddling, and attention are all things which the id likes. And hunger, wet diapers, or loneliness are things which make the id unhappy. The ego is the part of the person that starts to understand cause and effect. When the id wants something, the ego figures out how to get it. The ego also learns that some behavior results in bad consequences. For example, hitting your brother makes your mom yell, which makes the id unhappy. The superego is more like the grown-up ego. It looks at family rules, or society's laws, and tries to balance them with what the id wants. For example, a child sees another child with candy and the id wants some. The ego assesses the situation. Can I just grab the candy? But the superego, knowing right from wrong, says it would be wrong to take the candy. Freud's ideas became known as psychoanalytic theory. In his therapy sessions, he would encourage his patients to relive their repressed fantasies and fears. Successful treatment would help these fantasies and fears to bubble up to the top and relieve the pressure from below. Most psychologists and theorists since have based their own research on his. Maria Montessori was the first woman in Italy to become a doctor. Her specialty was pediatrics, and she was especially interested in children who were labeled ineducable. Dr. Montessori based her teaching philosophy on the belief that every child has innate skills and talents. She believed that by guiding children with love, that they would learn almost on their own. The Montessori method taught children through hands-on activities with encouragement from adults. A teacher's main role was to observe and take advantage of what Dr. Montessori called sensitive periods, where the child's mind was particularly receptive to learning. Dr. Montessori believed trying to force a child to learn something outside of these sensitive periods was difficult and frustrating for both child and teacher. Madame Montessori said that looking becomes reading and touching becomes writing. The Montessori method is still used today all around the world. Arnold Gazelle was born and raised in Wisconsin and education was very important in his life. His combined experiences led him to explore the question of nature versus nurture in child development. Nature being your genetic makeup and nurture being the environment in which you grow. Gazelle maintained that children develop in an orderly sequence which is set by heredity or nature. He believed that no development would take place until the child was ready for it to happen. What Gazelle is perhaps best remembered for, however, were his observational techniques. 
During his research, he used one-way mirrors and designed a special domed research enclosure to allow researchers to observe from all angles without being seen. Lev Vygotsky was a Russian psychologist, and though he lived at about the same time as Gazelle, his research led him to a different conclusion. Vygotsky firmly believed nurture was more influential than nature on how children developed. Vygotsky developed a five-step process of socio-cultural development. Step one, adults provide tools, modeling, guidance, interaction, and encouragement. Step two, a child performs tasks under adult supervision. Step three, adults help the child divide tasks into smaller segments and assess the child's understanding. Step four, adults provide support or scaffolding that is necessary in a learning situation. Step five, adults guide a child into a new situation through transferring familiar knowledge to a new or unfamiliar task or situation. Jean Piaget, a Swiss psychologist, was one of the first to take Freud's work and move it in a slightly different way. Piaget believed there are four stages of human development, which he called the cognitive development theory. The first stage he called sensory motor. Sensory means that the five senses are being used to understand the world. Motor refers to using your muscles. In the sensory motor stage, the child only knows what she can see or touch or hear. Piaget's second stage is pre-operational, where children start to learn by using language and mental images. They are still egocentric, but they start to broaden their understanding of the world and know there is more to the world than what they can see or touch. Next is the concrete operational stage, where they really start to understand others' points of view. They start to understand logic, and they learn something called conservation. By conservation, we mean that now children understand that this is three balls of clay, but if I mush them together, I still have the same amount of clay. The mass of clay has not changed. It has been conserved. The final stage in Piaget's theory is formal operational, where children really start using abstract thinking. They know the difference between right and wrong. They start understanding there are many ways of looking at things and can see shades of gray instead of always viewing things as black or white. Rudolf Dreikers was an American psychiatrist who believed that all misbehavior was a result of feeling isolated, causing a child to attempt to fit in through one of four ways. With attention, a child will act out to get noticed, even if it results in a negative response from the parent or teacher. With power, a child tries to take a leadership role and tell others what to do. Revenge is when a child retaliates against the people who are not giving her the positive response she craves. And avoidance is the worst of all. This is when the child simply withdraws altogether, not showing any response to anything going on around her. Dreikers was clear in his theory about how to deal with misbehaving children. He did not believe in a reward and punishment system, but encouraged adults to allow natural consequences for misbehavior. Eric Erikson was a Danish psychologist who studied the works of Freud and Montessori in college and focused on the idea of identity. Erikson developed a timeline of psychological development with eight stages. He said that if a person had difficulty with any of the stages, they would have a problem, which he called an identity crisis later in life. Trust versus mistrust occurs when newborns and babies learn to trust their caregivers. When the caregiver responds to the baby's needs, the baby learns that when he is hungry, he will be fed. And when he is cold, 
he will be warmed. And when he raises his arms towards an adult, he will be picked up and cuddled. Autonomy versus doubt. When a child learns that he has power of his own, he learns to walk and talk and maybe to go to the bathroom by himself. He realizes he is his own person, not attached to his parents. Erickson's third stage is initiative versus guilt, where a child learns to do things independently. As the child succeeds at different tasks, he will start to take initiative to try more new things. If he does not experience success, he will start to feel there is something wrong with him and feel guilty for not being successful. Industry versus inferiority. It is where the opinions of others start to matter. A child looks at the reaction of the important people in his life. A child starts to recognize that his own actions affect how people treat him. So an industrious child will act in such a way that gets good responses from others. Children who do not get good feedback for their behavior start to feel inferior to others. Identity versus role confusion and is pretty self-explanatory. These are the teenage years, when a child takes all the things that have happened to her in early childhood and hopefully develops a strong sense of identity. If the teenager can't do that, there can be role confusion where attempts may be made to either fit in or to completely separate from others. Erickson's final three stages are dealt with in adulthood, with the final stage dealing with old age and death. Abraham Maslow was the first of seven children born in New York to Russian immigrants. While working with monkeys early in his career, he noticed that some needs took precedence over others. For example, if a monkey was both hungry and thirsty, it would drink first. His observations led to the development of what is known as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The most basic needs, which have to be met before anything else can happen, are the physiological needs. Once those needs are met, the next need in the pyramid is safety and security. If a person feels secure, the next need that can be addressed is the need for love and belonging. The fourth need in the hierarchy is esteem. Maslow included two types of esteem, one based on what others think of you and the other based on what you think of yourself. Finally, the peak of Maslow's hierarchy is self-actualization, or the full realization of an individual's potential. Maslow estimated that only 2% of people reach this level, but that it is a worthy goal for all to try for. John Bowlby was a British psychiatrist and psychoanalyst who thought that bonding was an essential part of child development. He developed an attachment theory based on the feelings a child has for her mother. Bowlby outlined four characteristics of attachment. Proximity maintenance, the desire to be near the people we are attached to. Safe haven, returning to the attachment figure for comfort and safety in the face of a fear or threat. Secure base. The attachment figure acts as a base of security from which the child can explore the surrounding environment. Separation distress is the anxiety that occurs when the attachment figure or parent is absent. Many people believe B.F. Skinner is the most important psychologist since Freud. He developed a theory called operant conditioning, which used his most famous invention, the Skinner box. His research often used rats or pigeons placed in front of the Skinner box, and if they did the correct action, pressing the bar or pecking a certain spot, they would be rewarded with food. Skinner used different types of responses in his research. The first is positive reinforcement. This simply means when the desired behavior occurred, something good happened. Negative reinforcement is when a bad thing is stopped by the desired behavior. Sometimes, Skinner would set up the experiment so nothing at all happened, regardless of the behavior of the subject. 
If a rat presses a bar and nothing at all ever happens, eventually the rat will simply ignore the bar. The most interesting finding of Skinner's research was that always rewarding the desired behavior was not the best way to ensure that behavior continued. The very best way to make sure the behavior was constant was to intermix reinforcement with extinction. Apparently, hope for a reward is the most powerful motivator. Dr. Benjamin Spock, a trusted pediatrician and best-selling author, was born in Connecticut. His book, The Common Sense Book of Baby and Child Care, has been translated into 39 languages and is the second best-selling book of all time, after the Bible. The biggest thing Spock did to rock the parenting world was to say to parents that they were the true experts on their own children. Never before had anyone made such a claim. He said that cuddling babies and being affectionate with children would not spoil them, but would make them happier and more secure. And instead of following strict one-size-fits-all rules on everything from discipline to toilet training, Spock urged parents to be flexible and see their children as individuals. Perhaps most revolutionary of all, he suggested that parenting could be fun. Imagine that. Lawrence Kohlberg was an American psychologist from New York who pioneered work in moral development. Heavily influenced by studying the Holocaust, he studied psychology and taught at Harvard. Kohlberg was famous for researching how people solve moral dilemmas. The pre-conventional level is where children make decisions based on how it will affect them personally, kind of a what's-in-it-for-me attitude. It's egocentric, and the child doesn't spend time thinking about how his decision will affect anyone else. The conventional level is found in adolescents and some adults. At this level, decisions are made by comparing the options with what society says is right or wrong. At this level, you can understand extenuating circumstances and debate whether or not the rules should always apply. Kohlberg's highest level is the post-conventional level. At this level, everything is taken into consideration. T. Barry Brazelton is a pediatrician from Texas who has also written many child development books for parents. In 1973, he developed the Neonatal Behavioral Assessment Scale, or NBAS, which is now used in hospitals and clinics everywhere. Neonatal means newborn, and Brazelton's assessment scale is used in the first two months of a baby's life. It looks at 46 different physical developments and neurological responses, basically checking how well the body and the brain are working. Results can help parents and caregivers know how best to take care of the infant. It's especially important for at-risk babies and their parents, where the baby may have more issues or the parents may be less prepared to raise a child. Diana Baumrand is a clinical and developmental psychologist from New York known for her research on parenting styles. She categorized parents into three groups. The permissive parent is one who lets children have an equal say in all decisions. The parent doesn't punish the child and accepts whatever behavior the child chooses. The authoritarian parent is pretty much the opposite of the permissive parent. In this setting, the child has to follow every rule and gets no say at all in how the household is run. The authoritative parent is the happy middle. These parents talk with their children, but remain the adults in the family. Reasons are given for rules, and children are encouraged to share opinions, but they are neither always followed nor ignored.
Howard Gardner is an American psychologist who didn't plan on being one. But while he was in college, he met Eric Erickson, another psychologist working to further the work of Piaget. And he decided that psychology was the field for him. Gardner made a name for himself when he released his research findings on multiple intelligences. His theory challenged the commonly held belief that intelligence was one-dimensional and you either had it or you didn't. He identified eight different types of intelligence and believed that everyone has varying amounts of each of them, giving each person a unique cognitive profile. So what did I roll? His eight types of intelligence are linguistic or word smart, mathematical or number reasoning smart, spatial or picture smart, bodily kinesthetic or body smart, musical or music smart, interpersonal or people smart, intrapersonal or self smart, and naturalist or nature smart. Theories of child development continue to evolve. Researchers and psychologists are always working to understand how the human mind develops. They studied one another's research, building on each other's findings. As technology advances, we can learn more about the brain and how it affects behavior. As long as we have curiosity and a desire to understand ourselves, research will continue all done with the goal of helping us raise healthier, happier children.